Hello class, today um, we're going to talk about advanced airway management and, and ventilation techniques. And so um, we're going to talk about some advanced airways um, besides just the um, orotracheal intubation like we've been talking about, like direct orotracheal intubation. But um, we're going to move on to talk about blind nasotracheal intubations, digital intubations, um, trauma intubation and, and some things to think about when doing each of those. But before we go into that, um, let's just kind of review some things that we need to think about to improve our endotracheal um, intubation successes. And so um, we need to have good initial training. And so what does that mean to you guys? Good initial training. Uh, we need to practice. We need to have the training. We need to practice. We can't just learn it once in school and then forget about it because uh, we don't always get to intubate in the field. Uh, we don't always get to intubate in the ER. Um, but when the time comes, we need to be confident in our skill. So we need to practice as much as we can here at the school, our initial training, and continue to practice. And then we need to have that ongoing practice. So um, once this semester is over, it's not like you're going to say, okay, no more practice. So we're going to have good initial training. We're going to have ongoing practice. We're going to practice this skill multiple times a year. I mean, once you get a job, you can always pull out the airway mannequins and practice your intubation skills if it's been a while since you've gotten an intubation. Depending on where you work, you might be able to go to the OR and get some practice or practice in the ED when those patients come in. Um, while you're in school, you can utilize open lab time and come in and get the airway heads out and practice. So you've got plenty of opportunity to continue to practice. Um, something else that we can do is use tools that are available to us. So uh, one of the things that's available to us is the um, endotracheal tube introducer or the bougie tube or the swivel stick. It's got all those different names. It's the long blue tube that we've practiced with. Um, in the lab and so uh, it's a flexible device but it's stiff enough that it can be directed uh, into the airway and then you can put your uh, your ET tube directly over it. Uh, managing the neck pressure. What does that mean? Managing the neck pressure. My goodness. So that's the cricoid pressure. So remember we can apply backward, upward, uh, rightward pressure to that cricoid uh, cartilage and that can help us uh, to the cricothyroid cartilage and that can help us uh, to have a better view of of the vocal cords. So remember that you've got that at your use too. Um, optimal position. So we want to make sure that our patient is well positioned for the procedure. So make sure they're in the proper position. Um, unless it's contraindicated or impossible for reasons such as the patient's trapped, um, all patients need to be in that sniffing position. Um, or if they're obese, they can be in that ramped position, and, and we'll go over that in lab as well. Uh, we can also use some of the newer technology, video laryngoscopy. And so um, with this, it's pretty awesome. Um, it's changing the way that we intubate. And so um, video laryngoscopy um, is superior to our traditional just direct laryngoscopy because we can actually see the vocal cords on a video camera as we're introducing that tube so we can see it clearly. And then um, there's other technologies that are out there for us. Um, specialized blades, lighted stylets, fiber optic stylets, um, and different things like that. So, um, and the other thing is utilizing rapid sequence and sequence rapid sequence intubation, and we're going to go over that in a later video. Uh, so those are just some things to think about. So moving on, why isn't my clicker working here? Here we go. Okay, so the blind nasotracheal intubation. Uh, this is done through the nose and into the trachea, and so that's the route. Um, when are we going to do this? So our indications, we've got to have a cooperative patient that um, that's able to breathe spontaneously. Um, you might have a patient that's got trismus, or a patient, in the OR it could be a patient that's having um, a dental or an oral surgery that needs to be put under, so they might nasally intubate the patient. Or if it's a difficult airway, um, you could elect to do a nasotracheal intubation. Um, this is a blind procedure, and so what that means is that you're not directly visualizing the vocal cords because you're going in through that nasotracheal route, through the nose and into the trachea. 
uh, some of the contraindications for doing a nasotracheal intubation are nasal fractures, basal or skull fractures, um, extreme trauma to the face and facial fractures, uh, elevation of intracranial pressure. If your patient is combative or uncooperative, or if they've got a deviated nasal septum, we don't want to do a nasotracheal intubation. Um, and the big thing is to remember that your patient has to be spontaneously breathing to do this procedure. Um, whenever we're doing the procedure, always make sure that you're using standard precautions. And so when it comes to intubation, at a minimum, you want to make sure that you have your gloves on and you have your eye protection on. It's very important. Um, you might also choose to wear a face shield. You never know what kind of secretions could splash back in your face. So protect yourself before you start. Um, when using like a basic manual um, and, and adjunct maneuvers to open your airway, we want to make sure that we ventilate with 100% oxygen, so connect your BVM uh, to O2, ventilate that way. Make sure that all of your equipment is prepared. Just like we've discussed before, equipment preparation is key. You don't want to get in the middle of the procedure and realize your equipment is malfunctioning, so make sure you've checked out all of your equipment. Make sure your patient is in a position of comfort, and then inspect the nose, and you're going to choose the side that has the larger nostril. That's going to make things a lot easier uh, on yourself. Um, think to like whenever you're choosing to insert an NPA, we're going to choose the larger nostril. Same concept here. When we talk about choosing the correct size, so it's going to be a little bit different here. Um, you normally want to take uh, take choose a tube that's one and a half to a full size smaller than the tube you use for an oral tracheal intubation. Um, the average adult male size is going to be seven millimeters, and the average uh, female would be a six and a half millimeters. And then when you uh, before you begin, you want to make sure that you lubricate this tube generously. The last thing you want to do is cause nasotrauma and bleeding uh, to that airway because you didn't lubricate the tube. So make sure that your tube is um, lubricated. And from there, uh, when you insert that ET tube into the nostril, make sure that the bevel is facing the septum just like you would do for an NPA. And then advance until you feel it uh, drop into that posterior pharynx. And then once you get there, kind of listen for that patient's respiratory sounds. And when they inhale, um, just advance that tube directly into that glottic opening. You can also um, attach the entitled CO2 and it will start to increase as you get closer to that glottic opening, okay? From there, you can connect to a bag valve mask and make sure you're bag valve device and making sure that you're ventilating at 100% oxygen. Confirm ET tube placement using multiple techniques. So some of the ways that we confirm ET tube placement. Um, listen over all of your lung fields. Uh, watch your entitled CO2. Those are two great ways. Watch capnography. Make sure your tube is secure and then reconfirm tube placement. You can never confirm tube placement enough. Make sure that it's secure. Digital intubation. This is an older technique. Um, it's Right now, I mean, it's really been replaced by all of utilizing our extra glottic airway devices, but sometimes there's still a need to use this, that method when your patient is in a position um, where you can't do a uh, direct visualization and, and intubate that patient. Um, one of the key things here is to make sure that your patient does not have a gag reflex because this is a digital innovation. You're putting your fingers into their mouth to intubate the patient. The last thing you want is for them to have a gag reflex and you insert your fingers into the mouth and now you have vomit and secretions everywhere and your patient could aspirate and that's dangerous. Um, so make sure they don't have that gag reflex but then um, and use your standard precautions here. So again, face mask, uh, eye protection, gloves, all of those things that you'd want to use. Uh, from there, continue to oxygenate your patient before you uh, perform the procedure. Make sure that you've checked out your equipment. Uh, and remember that this procedure could also, um, by putting your fingers in your mouth, you could stimulate that patient to bite down and now they've bit down on your finger. So um, you might need to use a bite block in place to prevent uh, prevent them from biting down on the tube, prevent them from biting down on your fingers, okay? Um, if they have a C collar in place, you want to make sure you stabilize the neck before you do this. Make sure you place your bite block. Insert your left and middle and index fingers into your patient's mouth, and you can kind of uh, palpate their um, arsenoid cartilage, and then um, your 
essentially pressing the epiglottis forward and inserting the endotracheal tube into the mouth. And I'll show you all a picture in just a minute. Uh, once you advance that tube, you see it go through the cords while kind of simultaneously moving your fingers um, forward. Hold the tube in place, remove your stylet, inflate your cuff just like you would any other intubation. Confirm placement with multiple techniques. Um, listening over your lung fields, listening over the epigastrium, putting catenography in, play, catenography in place, um, and, and looking at your waveform, looking at end tidal, and then ventilate with 100% oxygen. And so this lap, next picture here is showing how you insert your fingers into the mouth and then place the uh, ET tube. Now, just my personal preference, this is going to be very last thing that I want to do. I don't ever like to put my fingers into a patient's mouth. That's just, in my mind, that's asking uh, for trouble. I always say, if it's got teeth, it will bite. So some things to think about now, we're going to talk about um, some special considerations. So uh, trauma patients and what kind of obstacles uh, they, they provide. So when you've got a trauma patient, you might have difficult uh, access to your patient. The position that they're in, you can't quite move them yet. They may uh, have the need for extrication or they might be trapped. Um, there's blood in the oropharynx. Distorted anatomy secondary to the injury. Uh, we may have to protect the cervical spine and, and hold it in place. And then getting a good, uh, adequate seal on your mask to ventilate your patient, to pre that patient. Um, ventilating your patient, applying C-spine stabilization. So you've got to hold C-spine in place and be able to ventilate. Uh, some other things to think about, you might need to apply that cricoid pressure when you intubate. Um, confirming your tube placement, securing your ET tube, um, make sure your patient's got his T-collar in place, and then reconfirm your placement. So when it comes to trauma intubation, there's all sorts of things to think about, like I've said, but the big thing here, the difference is going to be that you are keeping um, that cervical spine stabilized and so you've got to be able to intubate with that c-collar in place if that makes sense again we'll get lots of practice in the lab uh, let's talk a little bit about foreign body removal um, so uh, when you're uh, carrying out your basic maneuvers for removing a foreign body obstruction so if it's for an adult or a child um, you're doing those abdominal thrusts if it's a pediatric patient or a uh, infant, you know, patient one and under, then you are doing back slaps and chest thrusts trying to remove this foreign body. Well, um, if that doesn't work, just like you learned in your BLS training, that and that patient goes unresponsive, our next step is to go right into CPR. Well, um, what changes in your CPR is that you've got to look in the mouth before you give those breaths, and if you see what it is they're choking on, you can use your hands and remove it, but you can also use McGill forceps or even your suction device to remove whatever it is they were choking on. Um, and so again, you're using direct uh, laryngoscopy to look in the mouth and see see that airway and remove whatever it is they're choking on using uh, the McGill forceps. And that's exactly what this picture is showing. So for instance, your patient has gone unresponsive, so now you insert uh, your laryngoscope uh, into the, into the airway, open it up, look, you can see what it is they're choking on rather than putting your fingers down into that airway to pull it out. You can use your McGill forceps to reach in and pluck it out. There you go. So this was just a quick um, video just to kind of talk about, like I said, um, some things to think about when preparing to intubate, um, just to keep ourselves successful, keep ourselves confident, keep our training up. So remember, we want to um, to practice, 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 to be successful. So we've got to have good training, ongoing practice. Um, utilize things that we have to help, like like the bougie tube um, and some of the other optimal technology. Um, using, uh, managing neck pressure, positioning of your patient, um, and using some of those other technologies like video laryngoscopy and things like that and specialty blades and lighted stylets, all those things that are available to help us. And then we talked a little bit about um, nasotracheal intubation, which is a blind procedure. We talked about digital intubation, trauma and trauma intubation, and then removing foreign airway uh, obstructions. So again, if you have questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to email me, call me, and we can talk about it. But that is the end of this video.